Well, I knew from a, a very young age that I was going to be a cop. Um, really? I, uh, you can't join a, a police department or into a, go get into a police academy until you're 21, so I graduated early from high school. I was in a small town in Southern California. I wanted to get out of the small town and, and see the world and make something of myself. So I joined the military and uh, went to the Far East. I was a, a dog handler and I, I was in law enforcement in the military, so I was a law enforcement dog handler. But it was, uh, it was a whole different thing in the jungle. Uh, it was very exciting. Uh, we basically ruled the night, we being canine. And uh, it was there that I experienced the, the first loss of a friend. Uh, one of my buddies that was that was killed in the jungle while uh, chasing the intruders that we were charged to to stop the intrusion and uh, but uh, I, I handled a patrol dog over there and uh, then I did uh, narcotics dog bomb dog had to extend a while to go to uh, bomb dog so I did almost five years in the military and I got out. Uh, well, before I got out, I tested different police departments, uh, Houston, Los Angeles, and Riverside, and uh, got accepted all three, but I was getting out of the military in January of 82, and I would start Houston Police Department in February of 82, so hence my decision, go to Houston, and I'm still here. Houston is my town. So started the uh, police academy and uh, graduated, uh, honor graduate from the Houston Police Academy and, and then went to Northeast, the, the fabled Northeast of, of Houston where basically all the action was and, uh, and uh, my thing was uh, basically car thieves and catching rapists and uh, I think the, the rape victims that I had to deal with was something that had a a huge effect on my life, my psyche, and what I do now. You get dispatched to these to these calls, and, and you get there, and basically, I would find young ladies in one of two ways: either uh, naked and dead in a ditch after someone or, or a group of rapists decided that this young lady, though she might have excelled in school and studied very hard and worked very hard to get to where she was meant nothing more to them than a plaything for the night. Uh, and there were times when uh, a rape victim was passed around a group of rapists two or three times throughout the night. And when they get tired of raping them, they, they use implements to rape her with. So it's, it's very brutal. And they would either leave them dead in the ditch naked or alive on the side of the street naked. And that's basically the way I would find them. What? You know, it was my job, they just happened to pretty much, they would pick them up and abduct them on the more affluent side of town and then dump them on their side of town, which was in my beat. And so it just been, oh. uh, so it just happened to be where my beat was, happened to be where all the, the car thieves were and the rapists were, and that's where I was. So, uh, those were my things, but the, the effect that these rape victims had on me is that um, these women, these young ladies, had no idea they were going to be a rape victim and, and end up either alive or dead, naked in the ditch after being brutally raped all night. They had no clue. They had no plan. It was not in their, in their calendar. It wasn't their choice. It was someone else's choice. And when they were abducted, they were abducted very fast and very violently uh, in just a matter of a couple seconds, typically walking from their uh, apartment parking lot in a gated community, a gated apartment to their car, but it, and where they thought they were safe, but they weren't. So uh, the, way, the reason it affected me so much is because I felt that I had to fight the crime. I had to catch these rapists, of course, and, and we did. Uh, but uh, I also felt that I had to do something to educate these young ladies to prevent this from happening. And that seed was planted very early that I knew I had to do something in the education field and, and the equipment 
uh, providing area to, to make these young ladies safe. So, so note that. Another thing that had, had a, uh, a, a huge effect on me was, uh, uh, and I, I lost a lot of police officers on, on the department, a lot of friends. In fact, uh, in 1985, my first year on the department, we had five police officers killed my very first year. But it was uh, 1990 when a good friend of mine, a motorcycle cop, Jim Irby, uh, was on a traffic stop talking to the driver and the passenger got out of the car and suddenly very quickly shot him five times with a 357 Magnum. One right through his motorcycle helmet and uh, killed Jim uh, dead right there. And uh, you know we caught the guy and he was convicted and he was uh, sentenced to death. But now I had to drive not only to educate young women and keep them safe, but to educate police officers and train them to where they can go home to their family safely at the end of the day. And, you know, that's, that's basically a right we have as an American, whether you're a cop or you're a responsible citizen, you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whatever happiness is for you, first of all, if you decide that you're, you're happy with mediocrity, America allows you mediocrity. If you decide you want to be something beyond that and you want to rise above mediocrity, swim against the current, take the path of resistance, the, the hard path, and make something of your life, you have that right here in America too and, and nobody can stop you. Um, except the person that decides to, that whatever you, your focus is on life doesn't matter because they're going to take your life. That's not allowed. But you, you being the responsible citizen or the police officer, whoever you are, uh, you now have an obligation to yourself, to your family, to stop that person from doing it. Because we, the, the policemen, the police department, we're not your personal bodyguard. And as what I've said in the last few minutes, a lot, many times we can't keep ourselves alive. The bad guy kills us. So uh, we have an obligation to the right to life and obligation to secure it. So that driving me for everything from young ladies to law enforcement to military drove me to do more with my life than just be a police officer and fight crime. So I went into training in the police department, training uh, my police officers in firearms training, defensive tactics, uh, etc. But uh, also I started Hoffner's Training Academy so that I could reach these young ladies and reach police departments, police officers at other departments, etc. through my training academy. And, and this was back in 1985 and I started Hoffner's Holsters as well because I felt a need for a better way to carry the equipment uh, in an affordable way. So I started the holster company and then off police officer says, man, that's, that's, that's really a great holster, make me one. And then their buddies and their colleagues would say, wow, that's great, have them make me one. So it, it grew from there. 1985 really uh, is when I started Hoffner's, when I started the, the company. So well over a quarter of a century now and you know there's there's not you don't get rich doing what I do yeah, there's a cop or running the company that uh, that I run but uh, not monetarily but I, where you get rich is the the people that you know and the effect that you had on their lives I, I don't know how many times I've had a citizen or a police officer uh, that was attacked and won that attack and then later said to me, you know, 
when it was happening, I could hear you in my head. I could hear you saying, you know, give her everything you've got. Fight with tenacity. Never quit. Don't quit. Even they would say, even when I felt I was losing strength, that uh, that that the attacker was, was was going to outstrength me. Somehow, hearing your voice in my head allowed me to dig deep and do what I needed to to win. And I'm very proud of that because. To this date, to my knowledge, I've never had a student I've trained or a police officer I've trained killed. When Jim Irby was killed on that traffic stop, I think that's what really propelled me with my training academy to really start researching the human psyche and the uh, the physiological phenomena of the human and the fight science that is required to really have not just a really good training program but a training program that is the best it can be that that unequivocally provides the student with the absolute best chance of winning the sudden violent encounter and going home to their family